I fully believe that we would not be having this discussion today. There's a part of North Carolina called the Triangle. It's a finia-shaped region anchored by the cities of Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill. In the 1980s, the Triangle was growing very quickly as it transitioned from textiles and tobacco to tech and scientific research. But high growth meant that traffic congestion was becoming a serious problem, and additional transportation capacity was necessary to prevent handcuffing future development. So a regional transportation authority called Go Triangle was created. They soon identified a need for a rail or bus fixed guideway between Durham and Chapel Hill. Over the next 20 years, countless designs and assessments were made and remade for what would become a state-of-the-art LRT connecting Chapel Hill with Durham, also reaching the historic Black Wall Street in Durham that was bulldozed to make room for a freeway. Does that really surprise you at this point? Not only would this LRT provide some semblance of social equality, it would also create a traffic-free link between UNC Chapel Hill and Duke boosting the area's competitiveness as a research hub. Except, no LRT was ever built. After two decades of work and over $130 million, you still have to take the bus. Bus wankers! But the story of the Durham Orange LRT goes far beyond one transit system. This is a story about what happens when public interests clash against powerful opposition. It's a story about democracy falling short. And if we want to build better transit, it's a story that we have to learn from. So, what did we learn? I somehow always end up talking about this, don't I? Funding, fund, funded, funding. Transit projects mainly have two options for funding, the government or the private sector, usually in the form of P3s. Unfortunately, both methods have severe limitations. Government funding is very unpredictable, thanks to volatility from election cycles and budget cuts and general political activity. So they wanna shove a light rail down our throats. So projects are often heavily delayed or just never get built at all. Whereas private funding can be more reliable, but almost always involves heavy restrictions that protect investors. Restrictions that usually end up screwing over the public. Do you see a common theme here? The public usually gets screwed over. In the case of the Durham Orange LRT, which I'll just call DOLRT from now on, they chose the more traditional route of public funding. And it gets bad. The first budget in 2012 called for $1.4 billion in funding, with 50% coming from the federal government, 25% from the state, and the final 25% from local and other private partners. This funding model was roughly similar to the one behind the Lynx Blue Line in nearby Charlotte, North Carolina, leading Go Triangle to expect similar support from the North Carolina state government for the DOLRT. That didn't happen. In 2015, lawmakers suddenly decided that the state could contribute no more than $500,000. 500000 Chipping in half a million dollars for a $1.4 billion project is basically not offering to pay anything. There are plenty of conspiracies as to why the state even entertained such a harsh limit in the first place, but either way, it wasn't a good sign. But the state government realized they probably couldn't do that, and the $500,000 cap was eventually removed, and replaced by another clause. This one said that state funding could only be limited to 10% of a project's budget, still short of the 25% originally expected for the DOLRT. And after some technicalities, the state only agreed to around 190 million, which was more like 7% of the total budget. To make things worse, project costs had swelled from 1.4 billion to over 2.4 billion by the time the 10% cap was agreed upon in 2018. Go Triangle had spent years fighting the state, only to get less money for a project that was now more expensive. Later in 2018, the state government probably got bored, because they suddenly said that Go Triangle had until the end of 2019 to secure the federal portion of the project's funding, i.e. 50% of $2.4 billion. If this deadline wasn't met, the state said that they'd pull their own funding. To get that federal funding by the end of 2019, Go Triangle needed to submit an application by April 2019. To do that, it realistically had to enter official agreements with 11 local partners by the end of February 2019. February 27th rolled around, and the North Carolina Railroad Company and its operating partner, Norfolk Southern, were ready to sign. But it was Duke University who refused to even participate in the following negotiations. Without Duke's support, there was simply no way for Go Triangle to meet the state's funding deadline, 
which meant losing out on 190 million that the DOLRT desperately needed. And that's our first lesson. Funding is absolutely critical, and it often leaves transit projects extremely vulnerable to external shocks. The Purple Line in Maryland is another example. That project was a public-private partnership that involved $900 million in state funding. But just days before the state was supposed to receive that $900 million, a federal judge ruled the project ineligible for the grants. The point is that construction was put on hold for over a year until the ruling was overturned. This delay not only tacked on $215 million to the budget, but it likely added to a management show that saw the original contractor straight up quit. It's now March 2024, and the Purple Line still isn't open. Money is power, and this power determines the success of transit projects. But you know what else is power? Actual power. For the DOLRT to become reality, it was always going to have to run through Duke. As one of the most selective universities in the US, Duke has undoubtedly been instrumental in the growth of North Carolina. It regularly spends over $1 billion on research every year, attracting talent and capital from across the world and playing a key role in transforming the triangle into a high-tech economy. So whatever demands that Duke had for the LRT, Duke pretty much got. When the project was picking up in 2016, the university signed off on a memorandum of understanding with Go Triangle, generally agreeing with the proposed route at the time. This route included a section on Irwin Road, running adjacent to Duke's medical campus. Then Duke's attitude started to change. Bit by bit, they began to raise bizarre contradictions, complications, and a general dissatisfaction with the light rail alignment on Irwin Road. So Go Triangle agreed to a very expensive workaround to keep Duke happy elevating the track at Urban Road at a cost of $90 million. Duke kept quiet, appearing to prefer this option. Until, of course, they didn't. Duke turned around and said that the construction of the elevated line would cause vibrations far beyond acceptable levels near their medical facilities. Keep in mind that the only reason the track was elevated in the first place was because Duke asked for it. Disruption to medical operations is a valid concern, but it's not like trains can't exist near hospitals. The University of Washington and the University of Minnesota got around similar issues for their LRTs. Go Triangle asked Duke in 2017 for a list of sensitive equipment so that they could start proposing mitigation strategies. Duke provided that list in January 2019. Among the other shenanigans that were pulled, Duke asked for a $1 billion insurance policy to protect against liability related to medical procedures. Go Triangle acquiesced. Duke then asked for a $2 billion policy. The chair of the Durham County Board of Commissioners, Wendy Jacobs, described the situation succinctly. It really raises the question of what was the intent all along. Was there no real commitment in the first place? By the time February 2019 rolled around, when Go Triangle was desperately trying to meet the state funding deadline, it was obvious that, for whatever reason, Duke didn't want the LRT to be built. As one of the key partners necessary for funding approval, let alone one of the most powerful institutions in the entire state, they had the power to end the whole thing. Which they did. But my point isn't to explain why Duke vetoed the LRT. It's to draw attention to the fact that they even had a veto in the first place. That's our second lesson. Someone always has veto power, and you need them on your side. It doesn't matter if Duke was acting unreasonably, as many critics pointed out. Go Triangle knew that they needed the university's buy-in, and they agreed to pretty much every demand that Duke could throw at them. It's just that no matter what Go Triangle offered, Duke could always ask for more. Which is a bit of a shame, because it does cast a bit of a shadow on the very concept of democracy. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. In my opinion, the most concerning part of this whole saga was that, by and large, the public wanted this LRT to be built. In 2011 and 2012, the counties of Durham and Orange approved half-cent sales tax increases in support of their respective transit plans, which included the LRT as a core component. Just let that sink in. People voted for more taxes. That's how badly they wanted better transit. An LRT would also go a decent ways towards some sort of reparation for historical inequalities. This is especially relevant in the context of Duke, an elite institution that didn't admit black students until 1963, and Durham County, a majority non-white community where over a quarter of children live in poverty. The proposed DOLRT was far from perfect. The scope was less than ideal for such a large budget, and it missed the opportunity to reach key destinations like Raleigh-Durham International Airport. 
Still, a reliable transit link could spur affordable housing development, while bringing more education and employment opportunities to lower income residents. The fact that Duke had the power to end the whole project kind of goes against the whole idea of democracy. To be honest, there isn't much of a lesson here. Public support for the DOLRT was overwhelmingly positive, and it's anecdotal, but I've heard from people at Duke and UNC Chapel Hill that the LRT was sorely needed. I don't want to end this video on a sad, doomerism type note. What happened to the DOLRT happens all the time, which is exactly why we have to dig into these stories to try and learn something from them. The worst thing to do would be to just forget them. I'm thinking of making more videos on these lost transit systems. I think they're super interesting, especially from the lens of procurement and financing or policy that I've been focusing on recently. If you have any ideas for lost systems that I can cover, leave them in the comments below. I'm probably doing Cincinnati next. Bye.